Imagine there's nothing in this universe except two balls. One starts moving, but which? From the red ball's perspective, it appears that the blue ball is moving, and from the blue ball's perspective, it appears the red ball is moving. Relativity Length contraction is a strange aspect of special relativity that's often described using extreme examples such as a spacecraft moving near the speed of light or some object falling into a black hole. But it happens to everyday moving objects as well, especially when it's cold outside, albeit at an infinitesimally small amount. The red ball doesn't just appear to be moving relative to the blue ball's perspective, it also appears to become slightly smaller along the axis it moves. It contracts. Why? Math. Relativity. I don't actually know. If I had to guess, I'd say that this is the Universal Physics Engine's version of MIP mapping. But it's not very noticeable. If something was moving at 150 kilometers an hour or 93 miles per hour, then to a stationary observer it would appear to contract by roughly a picometer or roughly 1 one hundredth the size of a hydrogen atom. So we never notice this phenomenon in everyday life, but we can notice its effects. When we connect a positive terminal to a negative terminal, electrons begin to move towards the positive terminal. Contrary to popular depictions, they don't move very fast. In a wire with a diameter of about 1 millimeter, the electron's velocity is about 4.4 millimeters per minute at about 1 amp and about 22 millimeters per minute at about 10 amps. That's very slow and why it's typically referred to as electron drift rather than something like electron flow. Because of this movement, even though it is slow, the electron's reference frames are decoupled from those of the protons and to the protons, the electrons appear to become length contracted by an infinitesimally small amount. Now, if there were just one or two or 10 or 10 billion electrons, this wouldn't matter. But there aren't 1 or 2 or 10 or 10 billion, there are roughly 86 trillion electrons per cubic centimeter of copper wire. 86 trillion ever so slightly length contracted electrons. It is enough to cause a slight density imbalance of the electrons in the reference frame of the not moving protons, slightly more negative charge than positive charge. But because like charges repel each other, there is an almost instantaneous correction to this imbalance and the electrons push away from each other, effectively creating more space and thus restoring the lower energy state neutral equilibrium. But not all electrons are winners in this density correction. This displacement forces some to the surface of the conductor where they would be repelled out of the conductor if it wasn't for the work function holding them back. This creates the surface charge pattern, a localized buildup of negative charge at the surface of the wire. And since there are more electrons near the negative terminal of the conductor, this negative surface charge pattern is stronger near the negative terminal. A stationary charge very close to the conductor would feel a very slight negative electric field. However, since the positive terminal is depleted of electrons, the net charge of the wire remains neutral. This electric charge from the surface pattern is distributed along a gradient, decreasing in strength the closer it gets to the positive terminal. And then, near the positive terminal, a positive charge can actually be felt from the slight increase in proton density relative to electron density. So the wire is neutral in total, but not at local areas near the surface of the conductor. But this is an electric field, and it is very weak. To be felt, a particle has to be very close to the conductor's surface, and it is not what creates the magnetic field felt by a moving outside observer. However, I made a point of discussing how this surface charge pattern arises, because the felt magnetic field arises from the same reference frame decoupling that causes the surface charge pattern to arise. The magnetic field arises from the same relativistic principles felt by an outside observer. If a charged particle outside the conductor begins moving in one direction, let's say in the direction and at the same velocity as the electrons, then from its perspective, it will appear that the electrons are at rest and it is the protons that are moving and so they become length contracted, and so there are slightly more protons. The density is off, and a slight positive charge is felt. If the outside particle is positively charged, then it will be repelled by the wire. If it is negatively charged, then it will be attracted to the wire. 
If the outside particle moves in the opposite direction, then it will still appear that the protons are moving, since they are at rest. But it will appear that the electrons are moving even faster, since they're moving in the opposite direction. To the outside particle, both the protons and electrons appear to have a slight length contraction, but since the electrons are moving so much faster than the protons, the electrons contract more, so there is a net negative charge. If the particle is positively charged, then it will be attracted to the wire. If it is negatively charged, it will be repelled by the wire. But what has actually happened is the outside particle has length contracted itself due to its own movement. But to it, it appears like the other particles are the ones moving and therefore length contracted, just like the red ball sees the blue ball as moving and vice versa. The observable result is that we have a force that attracts and repels depending on which direction an outside observer is moving, and for all intents and purposes, this is a magnetic field. But we can see that what looks magnetic in one frame can look electric in another, hence magnetism and electricity are unified and we call it an electromagnetic field. Moving faster and or increasing the current increases the amount of electrons or protons that are length contracted relative to you. Maybe you can think of this as the volume of decoupled reference frames, and so we get a stronger magnetic field around a wire. Cables next to each other whose currents are running in the same direction will attract, while cables with currents running in opposing directions will repel. Why? How is this working? Well, from a relativistic standpoint, if the currents are running in the same direction, the electrons in the moving wire see a length contraction from the protons in their own wire and the protons in the other wire, but not from the electrons in the other wire, since they are moving at the same speed. So there is nothing countering the perceived increase in protons from the other wire, and thus there is a net positive force felt, and so the negative electrons are attracted, and so they attract. The same and opposite is true for each item in the wire. We can just as much tell the same story for the protons or the electrons in the other wire, but with opposite charges. And the inverse of this is true if the currents run in opposite directions. But this relativistic matrix is a lot to juggle and think about, so we just simplify this happening as a magnetic field. Look, if we take a cable and run a current through it and put a compass next to it, then the needle head will point in a certain direction as the electrons and the magnet align themselves with the field around the cable. If we do this on all sides of the cable, forming a complete circle around the wire, we can trace the direction in which the magnetic field flows, and this is where we get the right hand rule. Let's look again at cables that attract each other, this time with magnetic field arrows. In the middle, we can see the arrows point in opposite directions, their magnetic fields interfere and cancel each other out. But on the outside, they persist, and so there is an energy density imbalance, a low energy density area between the cables, and so the cables are attracted. You could almost think of them as falling into an energy density hole together, this hole created by their fields interfering and canceling each other out. Their lowest energy state is when they're together. It takes energy to keep them apart. If, however, the current in the cables runs in the opposite direction to each other, then the vector arrows align, the fields can be thought to amplify each other, and there is a swelling of energy density between these cables that is higher than the energy densities on their outside, and so they are repelled from each other. This is a common schematic shown in textbooks to describe the Lorentz force in terms of energy density changes through interference or amplification. The force exerted by a magnetic field can be said to move from the north to south, positive to negative. A wire with a current running through it is put into this field. Behind the wire, the fields amplify. In front of the wire, the fields interfere. There is an energy density wave behind the wire and trough in front of it. So the wire moves forward, both propelled by the wave and pulled into the trough. This is how the Lorentz force actually works, and it gives us electric motors.